Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me on a Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. This is an amazing turnout, so uh, thank you for, for coming here. I'll, I'll try to make it worth your while. <laughs> uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Professor Sosina Haley for inviting me here to Northwestern University. Uh, it's such an enormous pleasure for me to be back here. I think that this is actually the room where I took my first class here at Northwestern. I think this is uh, uh, where I took EA1, Linear Algebra. I think I, I sat right there. <laughs> um, uh, when I was an undergrad, I did my undergraduate research with Professor Chris Wolverton, and uh, I worked on hydrogen storage materials, and I had such a great time, and I learned so much working with him that uh, I definitely wouldn't have been able to make it to where I am today if it weren't for his tutelage. So, uh, so thank you for that. I'd like to start off my talk today with this question. Uh, what does a six-dimensional phase diagram look like? Now, obviously, we live in a universe with three spatial dimensions and maybe one time dimension. So it's not easy to conceive of what a six-dimensional object looks like. Uh, but what I'd like to convince you today is that this is actually a very important question when it comes to synthesis science. So suppose that we're trying to synthesize a material, and maybe a material that we discovered through high-throughput computational searches. Now, if I want to synthesize this material, I have a lot of options, uh, which loosely can be categorized as deposition from the gas phase, uh, precipitation from a solution state or a melt state, or a solid state synthesis. But no matter which method I choose to synthesize a material, in general, the starting point is to consult the thermodynamic phase diagram. So there are four main varieties of phase diagrams today. Now, the first two are temperature pressure and temperature composition. And I would say about 99.9% .9 of all the phase diagrams out there fall into these two categories. The other two categories are Ellingham diagrams, which are used to study the oxidation reduction behavior of metal oxides, and Pourbaix diagrams, which are, have uh, units uh, are axes of redox potential and pH, and are used to study the corrosion of metal oxide or study the corrosion of metal alloys, uh, but recently have also been used to study hydrothermal synthesis uh, by people in this MRSEC, which is uh, which is fantastic. Um, I would say that these diagrams are for sure useful, but whenever I talk to my experimental colleagues about using thermodynamics phase diagrams to guide the synthesis, uh, I'm always meet, met with a little bit of skepticism and distrust. <laughs> Okay, and I think that you know when I th when I when I look at this and I, I think about why there is this kind of uh, uh, skepticism about the thermodynamic phase diagram is that because anecdotally we know that there are many control parameters that are available during experiment that affect structure selection and polymorphism and phase purity that do not seem to map very cleanly onto the existing phase diagrams, right? So, for example, uh, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence where if you change the ball milling rate or the carbon ratio of, of, of ball milling, then that changes what phases you get. Or if I have hydrothermal synthesis, then you know, solvent selection makes a big difference in what phases form. Or impurity additives can sometimes guide structure selection. Uh, in chemical vapor deposition, you know, the plasma synthesis conditions, or in pulse laser deposition, the laser pulse rate. These are things that we can control uh, from an experimental perspective, but it's not very clear how we would be able to map those control parameters onto existing thermodynamic phase diagrams. So let's take a moment to just forget about phase diagrams and let's, let's fantasize for a moment. If we could make a useful phase diagram from a perspective of synthesis, what would that look like? Well, okay, here are just some of my suggestions or my thoughts, okay? If we're doing vapor deposition, uh, for example, MBE, molecular beam epitaxy, uh, we know that plasma, uh, the plasma parameters are very important. So maybe we wanna have an axis with like plasma fugacity, or uh, we know that coherent strains are very important. So maybe we want epitaxial strains on the axis. Uh, if we're doing soluble thermal synthesis, then maybe we want to talk about what solvent should I use to synthesize my material. Or for the precursor, maybe the counter ion is important. So like, why would I start with a metal chloride instead of a metal nitrate or instead of a metal acetate as my, as my soluble precursor? Um, if I do solid state ceramic synthesis, what do I control? I control the temperature of the reaction and I control how long the time, how much time the reaction goes for before I take it out of the reaction chamber. Uh, we all know that at the nanoscale, uh, nanoparticles can sometimes have different miscibility and polymorphs than the bulk equilibrium phase. And so maybe we want a phase diagram that has radius as one of these axes. And these are just some of the examples that we could have. You know, these are potential plausible phase diagrams we can make. And there are, you know, this, this is not just one possible term. We could actually add a whole variety of terms onto these diagrams, and that would put these into higher and higher dimensional spaces. One thing that in the process of doing this exercise that we realized is that when we think about what a useful phase diagram would look like, we might have axes that, that show thermodynamic variables 
besides temperature, pressure, and composition. So if you look at the Gibbs free energy, the natural variables are temperature, pressure, and composition. This is classical thermodynamic. You can use this to create you know, PT diagrams or TX diagrams that you might learn in you know, MSC 315. But in fact, there are many other variables that are available that also do thermodynamic work, right? We have elastic work, like stress stream work, or surface energy times surface area, or, uh, or you know, electromagnetic work, like charge transfer, voltage times charge, or you know, the electric polarization work, magnetic polarization work. There are many forms of work that I can apply to a material that are not accounted on its thermodynamic phase diagram. And when we take into account some of these extra forms of work, then that naturally pushes a phase diagram into higher dimensional spaces, right? And so if we think about the idea that a useful phase diagram might have axes beyond temperature, pressure, and composition, and maybe intrinsically high dimensional, then we're starting to get, we're, we're, we're setting ourselves up to this question about what does a high dimensional phase diagram look like? So when I was in middle school, uh, there was this book called Flatland. And Flatland, I don't know if anyone, is anyone familiar with this book? So Flatland is a story about this square, okay? <laughs> And the square lives in this 2D world called Flatland. And in this world, like, you know, the, the number of angles that you have, like, tells you how, like, what your nobility is. So, like, the more angles, the better. And uh, from the perspective of the square, everything is just a line, right? You can have, like, depth perception, but from the perspective, it's just a 1D line. And one day in Flatland, this three-dimensional sphere visits Flatland, and it visits Flatland, and it plucks the square out of Flatland. And now the square's mind is blown. It's like, oh, my God, I have this whole interesting new perspective about space and how we can do things. You know, later the square goes to 1D land and he's like, I can't believe these people just look at the, the butt and the head of the person <laughs> next to them. What I'm gonna try to do today is I'm gonna try to be your sphere. I'm gonna try to lift phase diagrams out of flat land. I'm gonna discuss to you what the geometry of high dimensional phase diagrams looks like. And I'm gonna do this from the perspective of synthesis. And I'm gonna make two major assertions. The first one is that High dimensional phase diagrams will reveal metastable materials that do not appear on the bulk equilibrium phase diagram along these new thermodynamic axes. The second thing that I will talk about is that in, instead of just looking at the thermodynamic axis, you can also look at the free energy axis throughout the course of a reaction, and this will actually reveal the kinetics of non equilibrium phase evolution. Okay, so we always start with the thermodynamics, so let's start with new phase diagrams. Okay. When we talk about phase diagrams, the first thing that we talk about in their construction is almost always the convex hull, right? So the convex hull, if you look at it uh, in, in, in undergrad or in graduate school thermodynamics, you'll start learning about taking the, the lower convex envelope of these Gibbs free energy curves, and if you take them at different temperature slices, that's how you construct the, uh, the phase diagram. If you're a computational material scientist like myself or like Professor Wolverton here in like the OQMD, you might use a convex hull that looks like this you can go in some chemical system. You know, the convex hull is something that people talk about in textbooks, and it's like, this is what you do to find equilibrium. But I started wondering, like, where does the convex hull come from? What's the origin of the convex hull? And I'll tell you right now, you will not find the answer to that question in any major thermodynamic textbook today, okay? In any thermodynamic textbook across any curriculum in the United States, you don't find that. If you want to know the answer for where the convex hull comes from, you got to go back and read Gibbs, like the original Gibbs, 1876, 1873. You have to read his papers on where, 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 where the convex hull comes from. So this is how Gibbs derives the convex hull based on two very simple geometric principles. The first one is called the stability criterion, okay? In a single phase, homogeneous substance, so a pure phase substance, the internal energy, which is the energy as a function of the extensive variables, must be convex up or else a compound will spontaneously separate by extent into its constituents. So you may have seen figures that look like this for like spinodal decomposition, right? Uh, you have like this stable region where it's convex up, and if it's convex down, it's unstable. The important thing is that this axis doesn't just have to be composition. It can be any axis. It can be entropy, volume, or the other extensive variables that I showed earlier. If this is uh, if this is has this shape in the volume axis, then a compound will will phase separate into two different volumes. Okay, a, a high volume or a low volume. The second criterion is the second law of thermodynamics. You know, we all think about the second law of thermodynamics as the entropy of the universe is increasing which is to me not a very interesting engineering statement, right? I've never been designing a material and I'm like, well, the entropy of the universe better be increasing right now. Um, the most important statement of the second law of thermodynamics is that entropy is maximized and equilibrium is reached when the intensive variables within a system are homogeneous. So the temperature of a system, if you have a multiple phase mixture, the temperatures have to be the same, the pressures have to be the same, the chemical tensions have to be the same, all the intensive variables have to be the same. 
And we all remember that the intensive variables are partial derivatives of the internal energy with respect to the extensive variables. Okay, if you have these two principles, then you can derive the convex hull. Basically, if you have multiple phases, if you have the equilibrium of heterogeneous substances, the multi-phase equilibrium, then if I have two phases, these are convex up and they have to share the same partial derivatives, right? So they have to share the same tangent lines. And in doing this, you see that this tangent line is also, you know, what we do with the lever rule, this is the convex hull, right? And on this tangent line, the, the, sec the partial derivative here is the same as the partial derivative here. That's the second law of thermodynamics, that you have the same intensive variable. And Gibbs called these tangent lines the lines of dissipated energy. If you project the convex hull onto the extensive variable axes, then you get the phase diagram. What's important about Gibbs' statement is that it doesn't have to just be composition. We're familiar with this idea from the perspective of composition, but you can use any other uh, axis. So for example, here is a deposition of a vanadium oxide onto a strained substrate, okay? Now by generalized or by normal Gibbs phase rule, you might think that there's only one polymorph that's stable at some arbitrary temperature and pressure. But in this system, VO2 spontaneously separates into two polymorphs, Utah and M1. So you can have two phase coexistence at the same composition if it's on an extensive variable of strain, okay? What I'm trying to do right now is trying to broaden your perspective of equilibrium in, um, in, with other forms of thermodynamic work. Okay, so Maxwell, the same Maxwell from Maxwell's equations. Maxwell read Gibbs's papers and was so inspired by what Gibbs wrote that Maxwell constructed this, this, this convex hull object and he, he constructed this plaster model and this plaster model, you know, if you look at this, very hard to interpret, but in 3D, it looks like this. And this plaster model has like iso pressure lines and isothermal lines. And to draw these lines, he, he placed the model in the sunlight, tracing the curves and the rate that grades the surface. So you get the perfect tangencies that he wanted. And what's unusual about this model is that it has the axes of extensive variables. So you have internal energy, entropy, and volume. Normally, if you want to, for example, if I want to study the triple point of, of, a, of a solid liquid gas coexistence, right, then on a normal PT diagram, that's given by the triple point right here. But in the extensive axes, it's actually given by this tangent plane that touches three phases at some temperature and pressure. So the temperature and the pressure are the inclination of this plane. So Maxwell mailed, you know, out of, out of, out of uh, adoring, you know, adoring Gibbs, Maxwell mailed this, this model to Gibbs in uh, 1875. And then last year I emailed Yale and I said, can you give me a 3D model of, uh, of, of this? And so here it is. This is Maxwell's surface in 3D. And so this is, you know, we 3D printed the model and I'll, I'll pass this around in a second. I'm gonna explain what you're looking at. So this has uh, axes of, internal energy, volume, and entropy, okay? And what happens is it's actually the internal energy faces downwards. So really you should be looking at it, the convex hull from this projection, okay? So upside down. But what you would do is you would take a board, I don't have a board on me, but okay, if you would take a board and you would roll it around on this and the inclination of the board, partial U, partial S, and partial U, partial V, that gives me the temperature and pressure. The reason why this is more valuable is because you can get all the temperature and pressure information from the derivatives, but you cannot take the, div the, the differentiated form and integrate back this concept. So this is really the fundamental object that we're talking about here. And um, if you want to, you can, uh, you can use your phones and you can, you can take this QR code right here and you can play with a 3D version of this. I'm just gonna pass this around. And so uh, you guys can all um, experience Maxwell's creation. But again, the important parts is that the inclination of the tangent planes give you the temperature and pressure. The colored lines here are the isobars and the isotherms. This convex hull, if I were to like wrap a rubber band or a rubber surface around this, that gives you the convex hull. So that gives you all the possible equilibrium conditions. But then the regions where it's still parabolic, this yellow line, it's a little bit hard to see. That's what's called the limit of essential ability, stability. That's the regions where it can be metastable, okay? This is, Gibbs's fundamental underlying geometric description for where phase diagrams come from. And again, this is not in any modern thermodynamics textbook. So this is what the real U of S and B surface for water looks like. This is something that we can use with modern thermodynamics data to get the convex hull. And if you look at it this way, uh, 
we can take it back to the T of T surface using what's called the Legendre transformation. So what the Legendre transformation is, is that if you take a convex surface like this blue curve right here, this is U of S, and you make a transformation to the envelope of tangent planes, it's this idea of duality. Duality is the same idea between real space and reciprocal space. There's a duality between those two objects. What we're doing here is we're taking the duality of the internal energy and the extensive variable, and we can transform it using Legendre transformation to a new function or to a new free energy as a function of the intensive variables. And if you do this, then you get this concave envelope idea, which is what we normally think of when we see uh, G of T and P figures. Okay, so, you know, went pretty fast, but this is the geometry of thermodynamics. This gives you a new foundation for new phase diagrams, okay? In an extensive natural variable, you have convex holes. In an intensive natural variable, you have uh, concave envelopes and you have uh, the inner half space intersection. Okay, so I'm trying to say that this will be a foundation for new phase diagrams. Here we go. I'm going to show you a bunch of new phase diagrams we can construct with this approach. The first one is a phase diagram for water, but this is a little bit of a tricky case, okay? We all know that water expands upon freezing. So what happens if I freeze water in an indestructible closed volume container? What happens? I ask this to my thermal class all the time. Can I figure it out from this, from this phase diagram? Well, if it starts to freeze, it's gonna exert a lot of pressure on the system. And I go up high in pressure, but then, you know, you know, it's kind of hard to say because what pressure is it gonna be at at what time? It's, it's not that easy, right? If with this phase diagram. So water cannot transform completely to ice, but in pressurizing ice, you're gonna have pressurized ice and pressurized water. So you're gonna have two phase equilibrium. And it's not just a cool thermo class trick. Uh, this is a technique used for what's called isochoric organ preservation. So there's this interesting fact about organs that if you store a heart at three degrees Celsius, it'll decompose in four hours. But if you store a heart at negative three degrees Celsius, it can last for 96 hours, which means that you can transport organs anywhere in the world. It's not a supply problem, it's a transportation problem. If you can do this, you put, it, you put your heart in a chamber and you make a little ice nucleus, and then it forms a two-phase equilibrium where it keeps the heart in the liquid phase instead of having the ice charge that throughout your, the rest of your system. Okay, so anyway, so normally we think of, you know, concave envelopes for G of T and P, but now if we do the Legendre transformation to the Helmholtz free energy, look, we have a convex hull in the volume axis, even though it's concave down in the temperature axis, right? And so if we do this, then we can now have a new phase diagram for water where even the inclination of the convex hull, this gives you the pressure at each particular uh, temperature. So this is a new phase diagram for water. It's such a common system, but it hasn't been made before. So this was done with Boris Kaczynski at UC Berkeley. Okay, so another system that we can do is nitrides. So uh, there are a series of nitrides called transition metal nitrides, like uh, these systems right here. And uh, in these materials, the nitrogen, we might think is an anion, but it's actually not an anion. Uh, it's actually more like an intermetallic subnitride. So you think of the nitrogen more like, a, like same that you would see carbon in an interstitial uh, carbon framework. So nitrogen, nitrogen rich nitrides are what we call semiconductors. If I look at this convex hull, most nitrides are in the metal, in the transition metals are nitrogen poor nitrides. A metastable nitrogen rich nitride can exist, but it's metastable with respect to decomposition into M and N2. However, N2 is a triple bonded molecule. So if we can break that triple bond, it would increase the chemical potential of nitrogen. And then this metastable nitride would be stabilized under elevated nitrogen chemical potential. It's not just an idea. Uh, uh, my collaborator at uh, NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, they do this system where they do nitrogen reactive sputtering on copper. And if you just sputter nitrogen like this, then by the time nitrogen gets to copper, it's recombined to N2 and nothing happens. But if you can reduce the target substrate distance and also the temperature, then you can get atomic nitrogen to react to copper and you can synthesize a new phase, copper 3N, which is a metastable nitrogen that is 200 MeV per atom above the hull. And if, you, if that doesn't number doesn't make much sense to you, it's a very, very big number. It's about 20 times what the, uh, what the average metastability is. And you can use this to benchmark that the chemical potential of nitrogen is plus one electron volt per nitrogen above the convex hull. So this is a, a new route to metastable nitrogen rich nitrides, which can be used as semiconductors. Courbet diagrams are a very important way to examine solid aqueous stability. The problem with Courbet diagrams is that there's no energy axis. Right? So you might be looking at material stability as a function of redox potential and pH. What we can do is we can add a free energy axis to Courbet diagrams using the Legendre transformation approach. And just the same way that the, Courbet that the normal phase diagram is a projection of the lower concave envelope, the Courbet diagram is also a projection of these lower concave 
poor bay free energy plants. You can think of like a Gibbs free energy, but these are poor bay free energy plants. Now, now that we have an energy expression for poor bay diagrams, now we can do really cool things. We can add other forms of thermodynamic work to the total free energy expression. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take a slice of the poor bay free energy at a particular applied potential. And then I'm going to make a new axis where I'm adding the surface energy times the area to volume ratio, which is really one over radius. So this is a nanoscale poor bay diagram. This diagram shows other polymorphs that are metastable that do not appear on the equilibrium phase diagram. And these are stabilized by a low surface energy. And what I mean by that is that at the nanoscale where surface energy matters a lot, these materials have very low surface energy and they become stabilized at small particle sizes. You can also make composition dependent poor bay diagrams. So here's another system in manganese oxide where the equilibrium phase is pyrolusite and hollandite, it has this tunnel structure and this is metastable. However, <laughs> if you put this in a solution with potassium ions, potassium is this big fat cation. It cannot fit in these holes, but it can fit into these tunnels right here, okay? And it's very happy to do so. And so we can make a new Legendre transformation of the poor bay free energy with respect to these two uh, forms of chemical work. And you can make composition dependent poor bay diagrams. These are poor bay diagrams where I'm putting it in a solution with a elevated potassium chemical potential. So I hope you're trying to figure out to see that we can have free energies that can be very high dimensional, right? This is a high dimensional, four dimensional uh, free energy expression for poor bay stability. And we can project it onto various sets of two axes. I mean, we project it onto the conventional pH and redox potential on pH and composition, on size and pH, or we can pick a single redox potential in pH and do size and composition. And what's cool about this is that this is an aqueous condition and this size axis, you can treat it as kind of a nucleation and growth axis. You can imagine that all materials nucleate at a small size and grow to big size. And this axis is something that you can change the potassium concentration in solution. You can titrate it to certain potassium concentrations. So we gave this phase diagram to our colleagues at SLAC, at Stanford uh, Linear Accelerator. Uh, and this is Borong Chen. She led their work and she's actually an alumni of Northwestern as well. So Northwestern does great research <laughs> after, after we, we graduate. So all materials nucleate and grow through the nanoscale. And you can see here that the predicted phases, the predicted phase progression is some delta phase, a Ramsdellite phase and some beta phase. And when they do the, the in-situ synchrotron experiments, those are exactly the phases that they see. They see these disordered forms of it, but basically the main polytypes that they observe are indeed the ones that we predict using our phase diagram. Okay, so I'm trying to show you that these metastable transformations, these non-equilibrium crystallization pathways that we see in experiment can actually be captured and rationalized if we make phase diagrams along other axes. So I've done a series of new phase diagrams. Uh, the one I haven't done yet is electric field, which I think is really cool. And this is one of my favorite ones. So I'll show you right now. So this is a material, uh, this is called calcium carbonate. And if you try to make calcium carbonate, this is the equilibrium phase called calcite. What I'm showing is the phase fraction versus time. And so first you start with this amorphous phase, which goes away and this beta right phase appears, but then beta right appears and then it disappears after a while. And then the equilibrium phase becomes calcite. So for beta right to appear, we might think that it has a low surface energy just because I just told you, right? All materials nucleate and grow through the nanoscale. So maybe this has a very low surface energy that stabilizes it. I calculated the surface energies of beta right and calcite and beta right actually has a higher surface energy than calcite. That's kind of mysterious. This material forms early on, but it has a high surface energy. What could it be? Well, when I calculate surface energies, I have to assume what the surfaces are. And I thought maybe I'm not picking the right surfaces. So I try to see what the experimental morphology is. And this is what the experimental surfaces look like. <laughs> Doesn't look like a wolf shape at all. Those are all spherulitic uh, materials, right? And so the formation mechanism of this spherical microstructure is fascinating. This is not beta, right? This is another material. This is called fluorapatite. Fluorapatite also forms spherulites, but it starts off as this kind of seat that we thought. But then as it grows, it starts splitting like this. And then it starts splitting even more. It makes these dumbbell broccoli shapes, which then close in on each other. And then it forms this thing and then it becomes a sphere. What? That's so crazy, right? What's driving this? Well, if I look at the fluorapatite crystal structure, it has alternating layers of four plus and four minus, which makes it have a net dipole in the direction. And so the growth along those lines are actually growth along electric field lines. Okay, you have ion by ion addition along these electric field lines. And if we look at the crystal structure of beta right, it's the exact same 
motif as a crystal structure flap type. It also has alternating two plus two minus ions, which also gives it a mid dipole. And in fact, if I look at the predicted Wolf morphology, it actually looks very similar as well. Here are fluorapatite spare lights and here are vaderite spare lights. You also see sometimes these little like fracture uh, lines in them. So indeed, these are this mechanism that's driving this. And if you calculate this material, vaderite versus calcite under an applied electric field, this is again, a Legendre transformation, G minus PE under a new form of thermodynamic work, you can make a phase diagram where vaderite is stabilized under applied electric fields under 0 0.1 volts per angstrom. And not only that, but actually when, you, when this experiment is done, this is a paper that I found, it's not very well cited, but it's a, it's a paper where they actually took calcium carbonate solution, they injected it into the system where there's a big voltage source that's creating an electric field. And then when the electric field is on, you get beta right, and when the electric field is off, you get calcite. Okay? So, okay, I guess I have to return to this question, which is, are metastable polymorphs kinetic byproducts? This is a very famous calorimeter. Her name is Alexandra Dombrowski, she said this. Many of the things we have ascribed to kinetics are in fact thermodynamically driven. When you don't understand something in archaeology, you say something has ceremonial purposes. When you don't understand something in chemistry and material science, you say it's kinetically controlled. <laughs> okay, it's a joke. It's, of course, there are kinetically controlled things. But I guess I'm trying to say is that there are thermodynamic origins for bulk metastable phases as well. If we're just considering what forms of thermodynamic work we're exerting on the reaction vessel, then maybe we're not accounting for all the forms of work that are relevant when materials are forming. And so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to propose this idea that we can think about phase diagrams in higher dimensional spaces. Phase diagrams that take many of these other forms of thermodynamic work on the axes. And when we do that, we can see metastable phases, which are hard to anticipate from the normal equilibrium phase diagram. But these are metastable phases that are stabilized under these conditions. And they can even be quenched from those conditions and retained in a metastable state. We call them these remnants of conditions where they were once stable, okay? So that's the first part. That's lifting phase diagrams into higher thermodynamic axes. <clears throat> the second thing I wanna describe is this idea of cascading down in free energy. Where if I use an in situ synchrotron experiment, I can also understand where non-equilibrium phases come from. So I'm gonna talk about today is solid state ceramic synthesis. Now, solid state ceramic synthesis is this idea where I take my precursors, I mix them in a reaction vessel, I stir them up, and then I put them in a furnace, and then I, I characterize them with XRD to see what I made. Oftentimes, when you do this, uh, the reactions will be incomplete. So you have to do something called regrinding and reannealing and firing this process over and over again, sometimes several times. Uh, there's some really wonderful work uh, that's done here at uh, Professor Kanatsidis' group uh, by uh, Rebecca McLean. Is Rebecca McLean here? She just graduated, okay. So she did some wonderful work where she's looking at bis bismuth copper oxycellulite formation. And here's the final target phase. And here are the precursors. And you see all these non-equilibrium intermediates in the, in the middle section, right? So, you know, the question is, where do they come from? And we might be able to figure this out by thinking a little bit about the microstructure of how these materials are coming together. If I'm forming a ternary ABC compound and I have precursors of A, B, and C, Notice that all three of these cannot react simultaneously at this tiny point in space, okay? All the reactions will actually initiate at the interfaces between two precursors at a time. So they're pairwise and they initiate interfaces. If we look at an interface, for example, A and B, and we're looking at the interfaces, and I have a convex hull in that binary convex hull that looks like this, which of these three phases will form? Well, I don't know the answer, but I might hypothesize I might hypothesize that the first phase to form in this reaction is the one with the most exothermic driving force, all right? The biggest driving force. Again, it's a hypothesis, we don't know. But an important consideration is that if I have a one-to-one -one ratio of A to B in my reaction vessel, the first phase to form doesn't necessarily have to have the composition of my starting precursors. And I'll show you a case where this is, the, where this is true. So sodium cobalt oxide is a very important battery material uh, for sodium batteries. And sodium cobalt oxide forms in two different polytypes, okay? One is called the two-layer type, T2. Another is called the three-layer type, which is form of T3, O3 prime, and O2. Now, if you wanna make a battery material, you're gonna intercalate and deintercalate sodium. And we would actually prefer to have the two-layer type and the three-layer type, because what happens is that as you intercalate and deintercalate, this thing has a lot of layer shifting and that degrades the battery material. You get fatigue stress on these materials and that's not good. So we wanna make P2. And in DFT, when we calculate the energies of P2 versus of P3, we find that P2 is the lower energy phase. So it's the, it's the equilibrium convex hull phase. 
and P3 is a metastable state, okay? However, if you go to the experimental synthesis diagram, this is not a, this is not a phase diagram, this is like an experimental observation, okay? P2, which is predicted to be the low temperature phase, does not form unless you anneal the sample at very high temperatures for a long time. And instead, P3 and O3, which are metastable phases, you expect them to be high temperature phases, these form very readily at low temperature. And the problem is that if you're trying to make P2, guess what, you're gonna have to grow through this temperature regime. So you're gonna have a little bit of impurity in your system and that's very unpleasant, okay? So, you know, we try to do this experiment. We're gonna try to take P2 at this composition, sodium 0.66, and we took it to a beamline. A beamline is where you put a reaction inside a very powerful uh, synchrotron source and we can watch the reaction as it happens. And so here's what we see. So what I'm plotting here is the phase fraction versus time, okay? And I'm splitting the time into two axes, this short time regime and this long time regime. And in this very short time regime, within 30 minutes, we see multiple phase transformations that go through these three layer phases. So very fast reactions through these non-equilibrium phases. And then after we form this phase, P3, we have a very long annealing period where nothing happens. This gray line is the temperature. If we kick the temperature up, we can finally get this metastable P3 phase to transform into the equilibrium P2 phase. So P2 is actually indeed the equilibrium material. It just forms a lot of non-equilibrium intermediates in the beginning. What we can do in computation, which has not been done before, is to plot the reaction energy of the system as a function of time. What we do is we multiply the phase fraction by the, uh, by the formation energy, and we get this progression, okay? We get this energy drop as the system evolves through time. And the important thing is that the first reaction occurs six minutes into the reaction, not hours like we usually think about solid state synthesis, and 85% of the reaction energy is consumed in this one minute right here, this one step. So what's happening? Well, we'll get some clues if we think about this. We started our reaction at, zero, at sodium 0 0.66 composition, but the first phase to form actually has sodium 1.0 composition. And just like I said earlier, if you're looking at the microstructural level, those particles, they don't know how much sodium and cobalt is in the system. They have no idea what the global composition is, right? So the natural variable should not be composition, right? The reactions that form at the interface will be whatever compositionally unconstrained reaction produces the greatest reaction energy. And so what we can do is we can plot the reaction energy as a function of the unconstrained composition. And indeed we find that the most exothermic reaction happens at sodium one composition and at all temperature mm. time, at all temperatures. And what that means is that the first reaction that happens at this interface forms sodium cobalt oxide, which is stable at sodium one composition. And at the, the compound that we were targeting, which is stable at 0 0.66, that's not the phase that forms because that's not the most exothermic phase at that composition. So if we were trying to rationalize this picture, the way that we would do it is we would look at this and we would say, the first phase to form at this interface between sodium oxide and uh, cobalt oxide is this interfacial reaction to this O3 phase. Now that I formed this, I'm gonna have leftover cobalt oxide. And the cobalt oxide is gonna react and that's gonna reduce the sodium concentration these phases are reacting with cobalt oxide and this O3 phase is topotactically templating. So using that same crystal structure, it's templating all these other transformations. And now I get to the last stage. This last stage has just a tiny bit of energy left. That's why it takes so long to get to the equilibrium state, okay? And so with very slow kinetics and the only way to accelerate those kinetics is to kick up the temperature. And once you kick up the temperature, then you can get to the equilibrium phase. So that's the story about sodium cobalt oxide. If we think about a three component system, then it gets even more complicated, but in a very interesting way. So like I said, you're not gonna get all three phases to react at some point. You're gonna get pairwise interactions at interfaces. So maybe the AB reaction happens first, and then BC, and then maybe these two form, and then maybe you get your final contact. So you get a sequence of reactions. One system that does this that's really fascinating is yttrium barium copper oxide. This is uh, the superconductor material, YBCO, and it's been synthesized like millions of times around the world. Like undergrad labs do this now. There's this one paper that has like one site, <laughs> like nobody reads this. It's like a one page paper that show that the normal reaction pathway is using barium carbonate as a precursor. And 75% of the recipes use barium carbonate as a precursor. When you use this, you have to grind and regrind your sample for 12 hours before you get phase pure sample. However, if you use barium peroxide, you can get the entire phase pure synthesis in one step only four hours. And so this offers like a really ideal system to study the role of precursors on synthesis efficacy, okay? 
So we did the same thing. We did in situ synchrotron experiments. If you start with barium carbonate as a precursor, barium carbonate does not decompose until 1100 degrees Celsius. And what that means is that as you're heating it up, the first reactions occur in the yttrium oxide copper oxide system. So you start forming some of this quaternary yttrium copper oxide in the beginning. If you look at the reaction energies, that's what I'm plotting here, reaction energies as a function of temperature. Basically, all the reactions are very uh, not exothermic. They're all very small in energy. When I switch to barium peroxide, which is a fairly unstable precursor, if I'm starting from an unstable point, that's starting from a high energy point, right? So barium peroxide and copper oxide will evolve very quickly to form barium copper oxide. And then this reaction will then react with yttrium oxide and will form YBCO, not in four hours, but in 30 minutes, okay? And I think that's pretty cool. It's not as cool seeing it this way as it is seeing in an in-situ PEM. So I'm gonna show you the in-situ PEM video of this process happening. I'm gonna start with the EDX, okay? So EDX is, the, oops, sorry. Uh, the orange, okay, I'll just stay here. The orange is copper oxide. This is where yttrium oxide is and barium peroxide is right here. And we're gonna map this <laughs> pattern. And so this is, we're heating the system up. As we heat it up, nothing really happens until the first pairwise reaction. Barium peroxide and copper oxide are reacting together to form that barium two copper 306 phase that we predicted, okay? And then, so this is seven minutes into the reaction. We form this, this, this first phase, and then as this heats up a little bit more, we're gonna start to see a variety of barium copper oxide transformations that happen over here. And it's got this spectacular, uh, I won't show it, but uh, let's see. It starts ejecting these bubbles. And these bubbles are little copper oxide bubbles. This is a peritectic decomposition, uh, peritectoid decomposition of barium two copper 306 to barium copper O2 plus copper oxygen. But remember during this whole time, yttrium oxide, a refractory oxide has not participated in the reaction yet. And after we get to about 850 degrees Celsius, we'll start to see that these two phases, the barium copper oxide and the copper oxide, will start to turn into a liquid. The liquid will melt and then get sucked up into YPO3. Then I have YBCO. So here it is, YBCO after 25 minutes of reaction. I think, I think that's spectacular. <laughs> okay, so uh, where is it? what we're gonna look at now is the phase diagram. So if we look at the phase diagram around barium peroxide and copper oxide, the important thing is that yes, indeed you form barium two copper 306. That's what we predicted from the reaction energies. But what's really cool is that the reason why this system can form YBCO is that the liquidus curve, the liquidus curve occurs at 809 degrees C. This is the lowest temperature liquid point in the entire ternary system. And so starting in this particular sliver of the phase diagram, this binary slice of the phase diagram, since barium peroxide promotes us to start in that place, I don't know why my reaction, my, my, my thing keeps moving forward. That's the origin of why this is able to, to form that phase in 30 minutes. Okay, so here are the takeaway principles. The first one is that if we're looking at the energy axis, the first reaction often consumes a majority of the total reaction driving force. Okay, you get a whole big drop on the energy. The first phase to form can be estimated by the maximum pairwise reaction energy. Because the precursors react in interfaces, by very thoughtfully picking which precursors we have, we can modify the reaction kinetics of the system. And even though I came up with this and you can write very nice papers out of this and you know, high impact papers, blah, 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 it's, we, we immediately found counter examples to our theory. So as a theorist, you know, this might make you upset, but actually it makes us very excited because we're starting to think, you know, there's more to learn about nature. And so we still lack a fundamental understanding of synthesis reaction mechanisms. And here are two counter examples, including the one from, uh, from here in Northwestern on, on this potassium business selenide system. My perspective is that DFT features that we can calculate today, formation energy, convex hole energy, this may not be enough to predict synthesis and synthesizability. If we wanna understand solid state synthesis, we cannot avoid trying to model the liquid free energy. And if we do this, then I think we can start to move towards predictive synthesis. Okay, so that's basically my talk today. I'm trying to explain to you some ideas of lifting phase diagrams out of flatland. Uh, I want to uh, tell you that I, I spoke really fast today. We talked about a lot of things and there's no way that I could go into enough detail. So these are all the papers. You can find them on my website and you can read them and, and learn more details about what we're trying to do here. Um, but I didn't, uh, you know, I didn't really explain. Okay, so let me, let, me, let me say one more thing. So, you know, there's this gap in the beginning 
And what I'm trying to propose to you, my vision, is that there ought to be new classes of phase diagrams, new classes of phase diagrams besides these 100-year-old phase diagram categories that will be better at explaining synthesis than we've explained. Let me show you. I didn't put this in my slides, but let me show you the very first sentence in Gibbs's very first paper. This is Gibbs's first paper. Although geometrical representation of propositions in the thermodynamics of fluids are in general use and have done good service in disseminating clear notions of the science, this is part of the reason, yet they have by no means received the extension in respect to variety and generality of which they are capable. Okay? Gibbs's very first paper says that thermodynamics has more variety and generality than there could be, and it's still true today. Okay? There are still more types of phase diagrams out there that we can make. And now I'm going to come back to this final question. What does a six-dimensional phase diagram look like? Here's the idea. First, you pick your axes. You're always going to have an energy axis, and you're going to pick your extensive variables. Okay? Once you do that, the phase pure regions, these are basically ND paraboloids. So we have like U of X equals some AX squared plus BX squared plus CX squared plus whatever other extensive variables you want to throw in there. Then you take the convex hull, the high-dimensional convex hull. And the coexistence regions are basically triangles, but are n-dimensional triangles, okay? So if you look at the thermodynamic convex hull, these are some convex hulls. And these are what we call n-dimensional triangles. They're called simplices, or simplicial convex polytopes. And so these are triangles of different dimension. 1D triangle, 2D triangle, 3D triangle. What does a 4D triangle look like? I don't know, but the mathematics exists. It's called a five cell. This is what it looks like, okay? So I can't tell you, I can't, you know, I can't lift you out of flatland right now but I can tell you that mathematically it exists and it's easy to interpret. Not easy, you know. <laughs> and what I want to show you is also that if I want to look at these triangles, here's some mathematics. This is called combinatorial geometry. I can take a look at this triangle. Look at this triangle. Okay, this is a three phase coexistence region, right? This three phase coexistence region is, bo is bounded by three two phase coexistence regions and three one phase coexistence regions. Likewise, a tetrahedron has one four phase coexistence region. Uh, let's see. Okay, so here's the, here's the data. So a four phase coexistence has four triangles, six edges, and four vertices. And if I go to a higher dimension, a seven dimensional simplicial convex polytope on a six dimensional phase diagram, it'll have one seven phase coexistence, you know, seven six cells, 21 five cells, 35 tetrahedra, 35 triangles, 21 edges. You know, maybe this is hard for you to, 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 to appreciate, but it's just Pascal's triangle. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? And this, what is a phase diagram except for phase boundaries? You get axes and phase boundaries, and you have the phase diagram. So this is a, this is a paper that we have in, public, uh, in, in progress right now. It's called Generalized Gibbs Phase Rule. If we know a general form of Gibbs Phase Rule, then we have a foundation, a geometric foundation for new phase diagrams. OK? This is a video of me doing virtual reality in my office where I'm looking at a lithium-ion battery and a slice. And uh, you know, with, in virtual reality, you can walk around and see things. Uh, I'm not, you know, this has nothing to do with thermodynamics, but imagine, imagine that we have now virtual reality for a phase diagram, okay? Imagine you walk into this and the phase diagram uh, is on the floor and you're seeing the projection of the free energy curve up in the sky. So you have the free energy here and you can walk around and see where the projections are and you can take tangents of it to get the chemical potentials and all sorts of wonderful things. And, you know, we could do this for ternary phase diagrams too. Normally, if you want to do a ternary phase diagram like this, you would take an isothermal section or some pseudo binary section. Like this is a pseudo binary section of the ternary phase diagram. But imagine instead we put all, all these binary pseudo binaries onto a true ternary and you can walk through this and you can, you know, you can, I don't think it's just for teaching. I think it would actually make us better at designing materials and understanding materials formation pathways. And we're currently doing this and also using machine learning algorithms to interpolate between the intermediate regions so that we can have a true phase diagram that we can slice just like I was slicing with the, uh, with, the, with the battery cathode earlier. Okay, so that's my talk, lifting phase diagrams out of flatland. Uh, these are some papers that we talked about today. If you want to, and if you're interested to, you can learn about more about this. This is my research group doing this, doing this stuff, lifting phase diagrams out of flatland. If, uh, if anything I said was interesting to you or exciting, please visit my uh, website and you can read more about what I do and, and see more of the papers that we've done. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I have to take some questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, question, either in person or on 
Sure. Yeah. I can start. Okay. So I'm very interested in the story you told last time and in general this idea of okay. introducing the ranger to mm. the new Mexico people. So if I understood that right, we have a method for saying that this book is kind of the first intermediate. That's right. Story. Yeah. What about after that? Yeah. So I think what I think what we'll see is that once you form the first phase, oops, sorry, I went too far. Once you form the first phase, that sets up structurally a template for everything else. And so all the other reactions that happen afterward, because you have such small driving forces to, to play with, you don't have enough thermodynamic driving force to, to make new structures, to make new nucleation uh, events happen. So basically, whatever first structure forms, you get that structural uh, template. And then there might be kinetic pathways, where, I'm, where I say kinetic pathways, I mean like, ion diffusion or you know simple like you know topotactic sliding these are the kinds of things that happen for a while in this case in order to get this second nucleation event which is to create a whole new crystal structure out of this crystal structure it takes a long time and it takes a lot of temperature to do so so um, i think that predicting the first phase is actually the most important fact and once you predict the first phase you can use geometric arguments for the rest of it So I'm gonna break down your question into two parts, okay? The first thing that you said is that it seems kinetic, but also thermodynamic. And I think one thing that we should do, if you read the first chapter of like the kinetic textbook that we use, which is Baluthi, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what is the first chapter of kinetic state? It says that all kinetics is, is local thermodynamics. It's local entropy maximization, right? Which is the same idea that if we forget what the reaction vessel boundary conditions are, and we just care about what locally is happening, Thermodynamics and kinetics are actually, they're not different. They're really the same, the same thing. The, 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 even the parameters that go into kinetic equations are thermodynamic in nature, right? So to say that the first phase of form is a thermodynamic or kinetic, I would say it's kinetic, but it's locally thermodynamic. Okay, so the local thermodynamic conditions govern structure selection. And I agree with you that the natural variables are not composition in that case, but really chemical potential. If you have the, if you understand the chemical potential differences, and you know what is chemical potential? You know d d mu dx. That's fixed first law. That governs diffusion. You know delta mu. That's the nucleation driving force, right? So all these terms in kinetics really do come from expressions that we don't normally see on the phase diagram. We ought to use chemical potential diagrams to interpret local solid state temperatures. So does that answer your question, or do you have more to add on that? I, I think so. I hypothesize yes. I hypothesize that if you have the full six dimensional phase diagram with radius as one of your axes, the first phase you see is reconciles perfectly with that diagram. That's my hypothesis. Hi. Oh, thank you. Sure. Wonderful, wonderful question. Is diamond metastable, right? Diamond is metastable at ambient conditions, right? And, but it's stable where it forms, which is high pressure and high temperature, right? And so you're exactly right. My thesis, I guess you can say, is that all the materials that we consider to be metastable are in fact stabilized under some applied conditions, which maybe we didn't anticipate, right? And if we anticipate those conditions, and if we plot the phase diagram along those conditions, I think we will see metastable phases, or at least they're precursors, right? So like here, P3 might not be ever stable, but O3 is stable. And so there is like a, a structurally kinetic, soft kinetic pathway from this phase to this phase. And this is what I would consider, this is indeed an equilibrium phase along that local chemical potential axis. So, so you're absolutely right. What does metastability mean? I, in this presentation, I've used metastable to mean bulk metastable compared to the equilibrium PPN phase diagram. 
Okay, but I believe that all observed metastable phases at some point during their nucleation and growth was stabilized under some applied field. And that's a contentious statement, and I've had plenty of people argue with me about it, and I don't know any, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be provocative here. I'm trying to get people to, you know, if you at least think in this direction, we can find counterexamples and build better science together. So, you know, that's a, that's a starting point. Yes, I can hear you. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> sure. Okay, okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Great. So 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 for people on Zoom who who, who didn't hear the question, I'll, I'll I'll try to rephrase what you said, which is that which is that how do we take things that really are non-equilibrium and not even close to equilibrium, they're just like transient conditions that appear in the, in the middle of a process, which how do we take into account those kinds of things and use that to govern transformations, right? Uh, I, I don't know if I have the perfect answer to that. By the way, before I say that, I just wanna talk about the slide for a second, because this is something I was gonna say that I forgot to say, which is that it, it seems to me that synthetic chemists are like the last superstitious people in science, <laughs> okay? I had, I had co experimental colleagues who were like, that is my labware, do not touch my stir bar, I cannot make my material without that stir bar. <laughs> you know, very possessive, which I, I always thought was really hilarious and, and a little bit irrational. Like we shouldn't we shouldn't try to try to promote that kind of thinking. But um, but when you when you're asking this question, which is how do these terms, um, which we consider to be non thermodynamic, I guess what I would say is so I would say two things. The first thing is that I believe they actually are thermodynamic. We just don't know what the connection is yet. So I'll tell you an example. Uh, one story that I didn't tell was like in ball milling, we found that we can stabilize this different polymorph that is unusual. It's like this low symmetry polymorph that was really hard to make any other way. But then uh, we did some high pressure experiments with like some grains and what we found is that basically this polymorph, which is this low symmetry polymorph, was shear stabilized. So on a high pressure vessel, if you apply a lot of shear, it'll form this like monoclinic distortion, or like, I don't know, like a C1 distortion. But, um, but basically when you're having these reactive ball milling, these balls are slamming around, that's also generating a lot of shear and that kind of energy stabilizes that polymorph. What I'm trying to say is that there are things that we, un that we do not anticipate, but if we sit down and we think about it for a little bit, we can try to map the mechanisms of these synthesis methods onto thermodynamic variables, okay? The second question that you asked was, how do the transient driving forces affect, um, affect phase transformations? And the way that I think about it is that it just changes the driving force as the reaction is progressing. So I might start at a really high energy state, and then I do my first transformation, I've consumed 85% of my energy, and I, I have a, a smaller amount of dragging force. But at every instant, I can ask, what's the next thing that's gonna happen, okay? So if I have like, you know, 10% of my dragging force next left, I can still ask, what's the driving force, or which phase is gonna form with this rest of the 10%? And I think from a self-consistent perspective, you might be able to eventually get to a point where you can rationalize things from some combination of thermodynamics and kinetics. And, you know, to be really satisfying, I would be quantitative and show you an example, but we're still working on it, so. <laughs> yeah, thank you for your question. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the question was, do I think fluctuations can cause this? I have a question for you. Are you an undergrad or a graduate student? You're an undergrad, yeah, okay. So when you take graduate statistical mechanics, you will see that fluctuations 
are pretty small. In fact, fluctuations converge very quickly to thermodynamic uh, natural variables. And, um, and that's not always true at the nanoscale. At the nanoscale, fluctuations can indeed be big and they can maybe drive things. But I think that, you know what I think about fluctuations? Fluctuations is kind of like a catch-all, okay? You can't prove it. And when you see something that you don't expect, you're like, oh, there was a fluctuation, right? It's very unsatisfying. You can't predict that kind of catch-all thing. If a theory can explain everything, then it can't actually predict anything. Okay, so again, if a theory can explain everything, it cannot predict anything. So some people take this Boltzmann probability kind of thing as like this, uh, as like a, you know, oh, there was a fluctuation that gave me some 10% probability to make this metastable phase. I think that's a very bad way to make a predictive theory of synthesis. I think you have to be, you know, I think this way is more predictive and more quantitative. And I think it is actually more, you know, when we talk about transformations involving even thousands of atoms, you're really converging to thermodynamic limits and not like local fluctuations. So it's a good question. And it's something that I, I, I get a lot from people who, 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 who wonder about this fluctuation idea. OK, so given the hour and the fact that we're probably going to end, uh, <laughs> let's uh, thank you for coming. All right. Thank you all for your attention. OK, great. Thanks again. Yeah.